Good morning, everyone. Please take out your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. After last week, I know you're all experts in the Passover now, but I'll do a little bit of a refresher on what that was. You'll remember that at the time of the Passover, uh, the Israelites were captive in Egypt. And as one final blow to the Egyptians who wouldn't release uh, the Israelites from being their slaves, God sent a, a final plague. And really, uh, uh, rather than a plague, it was him himself uh, bringing his judgment to the Egyptian people by killing the firstborn son of every household. As a provision for Israel, though, God gave them instruction to take a lamb and to sacrifice that lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and to put it on their doorposts and the, the lintel of the doorframe. Uh, and seeing that, God would pass over them uh, and not kill the firstborn child of that house. By the sacrifice of the lamb, the Israelites were delivered from God's judgment. They were saved by the sacrifice of that lamb. What we didn't cover so much last week was that in very close association with the Passover feast was also a feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And from the time of sacrificing the Passover lamb, the Israelites were to not to eat any leavened bread. From the, uh, that meal where they ate the Passover lamb, and then for the next week, they wouldn't have any leaven even seen among them. Exodus 12:15 uh, describes it like this. It says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything uh, leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. It couldn't be in their homes. It couldn't be anywhere. And so in Exodus 13, 7, it says, Nothing leavened shall be seen among you. And the reason for why that leaven was to be removed isn't specifically given in Scripture. And some have suggested it's because of the, the great haste with which the Israelites had to leave uh, from Egypt because the Egyptians would then pursue them. But the text doesn't actually say. What we do know is that leaven throughout Scripture becomes associated with evil influence. And so in the New Testament, you come to, sta uh, to statements like Galatians 5.9, which says uh, a little leaven causes the whole lump to be leavened. And that statement is also in our text this morning in 1 Corinthians 5. Also, you may remember uh, Jesus warning his disciples of the leaven of the Pharisees, the influence of their teaching, of their hypocrisy. And so in that picture of removing the leaven in the Feast of Unleavened Bread is really the, uh, the Israelites cleansing out the, the sin. And as they moved out from, from Egypt to, to worship God, uh, they were to remove those things from the past life and to be clean after the sacrifice of the lamb. And then we come to our passage this morning, 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul uh, draws a clear line between the Passover lamb and between Jesus Christ. And that line was drawn for us last week as we examined the Passover and the, the links between Christ and the Passover lamb. But Paul also draws a link between uh, unleavened bread, or, or rather leaven, and sin. And that's also important for us to understand this morning. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. That, that'll be our text. But before we do, I, I want you to understand that the key statement in this text is found at the end of verse 7. It says, Therefore Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. And really that statement is like the, the hinges on which this door swings, the door of this passage. Verses 6 and the first half of verse 7 uh, swing into that. They lead into that statement. And then coming out from that uh, is verse 8. You know, the way we'll look at the passage is in, in five sections. In verses 6 to 7, we'll see that the dire situation, the threat of corruption, and the call for church purity. And they really lead into the reason for that purity, which is the Passover lamb. So that'll be our fourth point. And then that'll lead us to keeping the feast in light of the lamb. So let's read together. We'll read from uh, verse 1 through to verse 8 for the sake of context. So 1 Corinthians 5. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife, 
You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Before we continue, let's pray. Father, immediately as we come to this passage, it is uh, confronting. Lord, we just ask the, this morning that uh, what we would see is, is Christ. Uh, Lord, we ask that uh, as we look at this, we would understand the great need for purity in the church and that we would understand that the means of that purity is, is through Christ. Lord, we just ask as the word goes forth that it would uh, achieve your purposes. Uh, may you powerfully work in, in us uh, so that we might behold the Lamb. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is immediately clear when we come to this passage is the unusual circumstances and the extreme circumstances. It really is a dire situation. And it's a situation that causes Paul in, in verse 6 to, to say, your boasting is not good. And what he's really saying there is that the boasting of the Corinthians is so incompatible with the current situation, it is outrageous that it is even occurring. It shouldn't be there. As you saw in, in, in verse 1, reports have come to, to Paul of a, a particularly sick kind of immorality. And those reports may have come from uh, the household of Chloe, who was a member of the Corinthian church mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1. And there they had brought uh, reports to Paul about other issues in the church, such as, a, as, a, as sectarianism, uh, following after individual leaders and splits in the, in the church as a result of that. So maybe they brought the report, but it seems also that this is a generally known thing. So perhaps from multiple sources, Paul has received a report of this kind of immorality. And is a particularly twisted kind, a, a, an illicit sexual relationship between a man and his father's wife. Sexual immorality between a, a man and his stepmother. And Paul calls that out and says, not even among the pagans is such immorality occurring. Uh, that is, in Corinth, even uh, in the Corinthian city, which was known for its sexual immorality, which was known for its uh, temple cult prostitutes, which is known for uh, all kinds of vices, not even there was that acceptable. But somehow it had found its way into the church, and that was bad enough, but when we come to verse 2, we see that it hadn't even been dealt with. It says in verse 2, You have become arrogant, and have not mourned instead. The people should have responded with mourning. They should have responded with repentance. Now, not only the man, but Paul is actually addressing the Corinthian church. Sure, the man hasn't repented, he hasn't mourned, uh, but the church at least should have. The church should have been troubled and distressed by this. This is a, an assault on the purity of the church. And so they should have been deeply grieved for the damage this did to the witness of that church, to the damage it did to, to the glory of God, the dishonor done to God, to mourn over the devastating impact it might have on other church members, or to mourn for that man's soul, now that it impacted his witness for Christ and covered him in shame and guilt. Mourning should have been the appropriate response for that. But Paul uh, comes to verse 6 and he says that they're actually boasting. So how, how does someone be proud in such a situation where uh, such vile immorality is occurring? 
Now really, chapters 1 to 4 address that. They'd been caught up in, in something else. They'd been caught up in uh, a love for, for human wisdom. You see, in the, in the uh, first chapters, Paul addresses an issue that's well known to us, and, and that is of the Corinthians going after their, their favorite teacher, whether it was Paul who ministered at the Corinthian church for a year and a half, or Apollos who followed Paul and ministered there after him, or Peter, uh, who they would have known famously from a, from a distance. And then some even claimed the, the high ground of saying, I am of Christ. Top that. And so they each formed their little subdivision and became proud of that sect, became proud of the teacher that they followed. And in doing so, they exalted human wisdom and human effort over the work of God. And so Paul has to uh, address that. And he just says in, in chapter 3, verse 5, What then is Apollos and what then is Paul? They're servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God caused the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. And so they went to exalt in man, but they, that is what they were doing. And so uh, they, they ended up esteeming human wisdom. And so Paul has to address them again in chapter 3, verse 18, and says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, that they are useless. So then, let no one boast in men. And so each of them believed they were wise. And Paul has to remind them again in, in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 6, not to exalt one another against themselves, uh, each other. Not to exalt themselves against each other. And yet they, they thought they were worthy of, of preeminence among themselves. And Paul says to them again in chapter 4, not even the apostles uh, enjoy that, that sort of status. In fact, the, the apostles were ridiculed and humbled people. And so theologically, in, in chapters 1 to 4, he just shows that pr pride is not valid. He says to them, uh, what do you have that you have not received? It's all from God. But yet that boasting exists. And then he comes to chapter 5, and you can sense the exasperation in his tone. He's saying to them, he's like, never mind any of the, the first four chapters. How can you be proud when this type of sin exists among you? Now, it would be enough for him to give those theological reasons in those first four chapters, but just practically looking at the situation of the church, that a pride is outrageous. Because the sin exists there. And it's like a, a leper boasting of good health. Now, when the skin disease is, is clear to everyone. Uh, and we see this commonly today. Ministries or, or churches boasting of great impact for Christ, boasting of, of great work for, for His kingdom. But yet there's sin that is, is simply tolerated. And it's not just that it's sin exists there, but it doesn't seem to be an issue. There's, there's no repentance we would expect being sinners for there to be sin among us. But as believers, we know the appropriate response is, is repentance and turning from that. But yet here, in our text and in many places, it's being swept under the carpet and ignored and treated as okay. But the Apostle Paul says to us this morning, it's not okay. Sin is an issue and it needs to be dealt with. And this morning at Grace Bible Fellowship, we cannot pretend that we are above that or beyond that because then we would be susceptible to falling into the same error that the Corinthians did, now that their, their pride blinded them to the sin that had existed there. And so we need to examine ourselves, not just as a church, but as individuals to see where pride may be blinding us to sin in our lives. It's so easy for us to slip into we, we become pride maybe about some aspect, maybe it's a, a good theology or knowledge of, of doctrine, or maybe some other work or, or, or whatever it may be, and we glory in that, 
and, and we start to become untouchable in the other areas of our lives. They start to become excused. But we can't do that. Uh, we need to examine ourselves holistically and humble ourselves and, and repent of sin that exists. And Paul says to them, you, you need to deal with this. Your boasting is not good. It's out of place. And, and he adds uh, to the urgency of this by telling them it's, it's not just an issue that this man is there not in and of himself for himself, uh, but he says there's a threat of corruption in the church. And you see that in, in the second half of, of verse 6, where Paul begins his comparison uh, to leaven, to the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, and to the Passover Feast. In verse 6b, he just says, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? He's saying that leaven cannot be isolated. You can't keep it in, in one spot. Once a small amount is in, it affects everything. I don't know how familiar you are with, with leaven, but uh, yeast is probably the, the leavening agent you, you most know. And uh, it's, it's actually a, a microscopic fungus, um, which may be another reason why they were meant to, to remove it, because who wants to eat a fungus anyway? But um, probably not. Basically, uh, when cooked, the, the fungus consumes sugar and it, it releases uh, carbon dioxide, and that's what causes the um, bread to, to spread out. Uh, I don't know what the technical term is. <laughs> I don't bake very often. But uh, the, the, uh, it, it, it pervades through that dough and it influences everything around it. And you see that when you have a, a fluffy piece of bread and the air has, uh, has moved through it and just puffed it right up. It's gone through everything. And so it's a, a dominating influence in that dough. You can't contain it. You can't keep it in one spot. It moves throughout everything. Nowhere in that dough is safe. And so as we, we look at our, our passage, we need to define what that leaven is. And in this case, in this verse, it is uh, the man, the, the sinful influence of that man in the church. And the, the, the lump of, of dough is, is the church, which ought to be a, a pure lump. And there's two things there. Is, is once you have a, uh, the unrepentant sin, sin that is not treated as, as sin and, and dealt with, then uh, you have a, 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 a blight on, on the whole of the church because everyone's together in that church. But then you also have a threat of that spreading, uh, of that moving uh, throughout believers. That's why Paul tells the, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15:33, uh, "Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals." And so he says, tolerating unrepentant sinners in the church is a, is a fast track uh, to that sin spreading. He says, if you keep it there, uh, watch it spread. And I think we, we know this instinctively because we say things like, "One bad apple." spoils the whole bunch. In fact, just this week, I went to the fridge, I opened the drawer, and there it was, a bad apple. And that apple was uh, slightly rotten, and I noticed the apple next to it was starting to go the same way. And so I shut the door and I left it in there. <laughs> no, I, t I t opened the door and I took the apple out and I put it away. <laughs> And I did that because I knew that it would spread to the other apples. It's also like a, a virus, the, the Ebola virus, I think it was back in 2014. They say that it originated just from one person, it's from one person in, in Guinea, and then it spread across the African continent and killed 11,000 people. The deadly influence of, of sin spreads much like that. And we need to be careful that we don't underestimate the corrupting influence of it. That's why in, in other scriptures where uh, Paul exhorts people to, to help uh, people struggling in sin and to go and, and, and help them. But in Galatians 6.1, he says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. 
There's the real danger of us also being tempted, so that's to be done with great caution. In Jude 22 and 23, it's the same thing. He says, have mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. And so he says that for those people, now you are to help them, but be careful, because you are also susceptible to being caught in sin. We are easily influenced, and we're not, a, we're not above uh, the influence of others, so we need to remove the corrupting influence from among us. And so that is to be done in the church, but uh, also in our lives, we need to be careful of the, the influences that we have. Will they move us towards Christ, or will they move us away from Him? They need to be dealt with, and they need to be removed. And it, so it is in the church, and so... Paul gives a call for church purity in verse 7. He clearly instructs what is to be done. He says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. They're exact, they would do exactly what the Jews would do at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that is to, to move out the leaven, to clean it out. And what that means is, is given to us in, in verse 2. He says, you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. And so he says they they needed to get this guy out of the church. And if he was not willing to repent, uh, if he was not willing to confess his sin and and, uh, move away from that, then he needed to be moved out of the church. Uh, That cannot be tolerated in Christ's bride. And so Paul just says, uh, in verses 3, he says, for, for I on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I was present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And he says this isn't an unclear case. Now, this is a case in which the person is to be removed from the church as the Lord had instructed in Matthew 18. That someone who is unwilling to, to repent of, of sin after being confronted, first by a brother, then with a witness, and then before the church, and then to be removed from the congregation. He says he is to be delivered to Satan, and, and just to give a, a brief explanation, it means to be put out of the church into the world, really delivered to the address of Satan, which is the world. Scripture says he is the, the God of this world, and that this world lay, lays in his lap. And so he's really to be put outside of the blessing uh, of the church, and it says there, for the, the destruction of his flesh. And because it's there, we'll... we'll um, explain that briefly but the best explanation for that is just that that is a form of discipline and that it would be perhaps in in various illness or or whatever an affliction on that man that would cause him to hopefully repent or perhaps even just a a terror of the world and a recognition um, of how uh, dire it is to be outside of of God's blessing and, and the church but the aim is for, for him to be restored, for him to recognize his sin and, and to be restored. And so he says he's doing this so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So the goal for that man is, is, is restoration. <clears throat> but more than that, in this passage, the goal of removing that is the purity of the church. And that's what Paul focuses on. To him, it's unthinkable that this would exist in the church. But why that emphasis? Why such an emphasis on the church being pure? Why does that matter so much to Paul? Verse 7 gives us that reason. It gives us the reason for purity. He says, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened, for Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. For us to understand this, we need to understand the, the chronology of the Passover. We said at the beginning that uh, at the time that the, the Passover lamb was, was sacrificed, 
uh, the Jews would then take the blood and, and put it on the doorposts. Then they would cook and eat the, the lamb, and, and with that meal they would have unleavened bread. And then for the, uh, from that day, which was the 14th day of the first month, uh, until the 21st day of the, of the first month, they were not to eat anything with leaven. And so at the time of the, the sacrifice of the lamb, the leaven was removed. And then for the next week, the feast of unleavened bread was to be kept. The sacrifice of the lamb was followed by the feast of unleavened bread. But the Jews were not saved because of the feast of unleavened bread. The Jews were saved because of the sacrifice of the lamb. Now Exodus 12:13 is, is very clear on this. It says, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so it is the sacrifice of the Lamb that delivered them. That is what brought their salvation. And the Apostle Paul says, now it's the same for us. It is the sacrifice of the Lamb which brings our salvation. That is what purifies us. And he even says there, now, you are unleavened. You already are unleavened because of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Uh, Jesus Christ was, uh, died on our behalf. He died on our behalf, taking our sin, purifying us of that, uh, justifying us from, before God, saving us from judgment, but also cleansing us, removing that sin from us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is, through Christ's sacrifice, we became the righteousness of God. Titus 2.14 tells us that Christ Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. By giving himself up as a sacrifice, Christ purified a people. He cleansed them of their sin by, by taking it upon himself and, and removing their guilt, removing their shame. And he set them apart for himself. Likewise, in Ephesians 5, uh, 25, Paul says um, that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Again, Christ gave himself up as a sacrifice, as that lamb to purify for himself a bride, to make a people holy. And he did not fail in doing that. That's not a, that's not a possibility. That's something that his death achieved. It did that. And that's why Paul so often refers to believers as saints, as holy ones. And even uh, beginning this letter to the Corinthians, he refers to the, the Corinthian church calling them saints, calling them holy ones. Listen, the, the Corinthian church is not a list of, of people that you're ever going to see on the Roman Catholic list of saints. They won't be there, but Paul says they are because believers are made holy in Christ. And that's the only reason, and that's why in chapter one, Paul, or chapter two, actually, Paul comes in and says to them, "This is why I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, because that is what purifies a people. That is what saves, and that is why when Paul brings us here in chapter five, he says that you are unleavened because Christ, our, sac uh, our Passover Lamb, also has been sacrificed." And we need to note that if Christ hasn't been sacrificed on our behalf, then what are we doing here? We have, we have no hope. It's impossible for us to change, as, as Jeremiah says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or can the leopard change his spots? Then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. 
Without Christ, we are doomed. We could not be pure. Even if we were going after good works, we could never cover up the evil that we have already done. But we know that He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. That's why back in our text, everything hinges on the words, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And maybe this morning you find yourself trying to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread without having looked to the Passover lamb. That is, maybe you are pursuing good works, pursuing a sanctification, without ever having put faith in Christ, which is the only thing that will actually purify you. If that is you, if you're pursuing a salvation by your own works, then this morning it's time to give up and recognize that the only thing that will ever justify you before God is is the work of Christ, the Lamb who was given as a sacrifice so that you might be saved. And in putting your faith in Him, He will purify you. It is then and only then that the church is, is purified. And that's why he says that the church is unleavened. The church already is unleavened because of what Christ has done. But there is this leaven that is still there. And so it correlates to our positional justification before God. That is that in God's sight we are righteous and holy and blameless because of Christ's sacrifice. But yet practically there is still sin there. And Paul says to them, uh, you are holy before God, so live that out. Christ has, has saved you and made you a holy people, so now live a pure life. And that tension is, is held out in Scripture repeatedly of, of becoming what we are. And Christ has saved us to be holy, and now we are, are going after that holiness. We call that progressive sanctification. And I heard one uh, preacher recently compare it to, to DNA. I'm no biologist, uh, but DNA apparently, basically from uh, uh, shortly after conception, will determine uh, the physical characteristics of a, of a person. And that genetic code is, is set very early on, and, and that has already determined for that person maybe their height, their eye color, their hair color, whether it be stocky, lanky, whatever the, the characteristics may be, are, are set at that very early point. And so it is for us when we are reborn in Christ. Our spiritual DNA is, is holiness. And that's where we're headed. And so as people who have been purified by the Lamb, we want to go after that purity that Christ has enabled us to pursue. If we desire for, for Christ to be glorified, and I think we do, then we'll desire for Him to have uh, what he gave himself up for, uh, a pure church. We want him to, to have a, a holy people. And that's what the, the Holy Spirit wants for us also. That's why he told us in, in verse 8 back in 1 Corinthians 5 to, to keep the feast. And it's, it's keeping the feast in light of what the Lamb has done. So he says in, in verse 8, Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. And since Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed, now it's time for that feast. And of course, he's not talking about a literal feast, but he's using it figuratively, as he has been using leaven and the Passover in this passage. Uh, to refer back to to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread correlating now to this time of sanctification uh, where we are to be removing that sinfulness from ourselves by the power of Christ, looking to the Lamb because of what Christ has done. Practically pursuing the holiness that God has bought for us. We need to recognize that therefore in verse 8. That, that connects this back to the sacrifice of the Lamb. This connects it back to Christ. And sanctification is to be done in light of the Lamb, 
by beholding Christ our Savior. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That is, we are transformed by beholding the glory of the Lord, by seeing Christ, by looking to Him. And so we need to recognize that sanctification is uh, inextricably linked with salvation. And so those being sanctified ought to be inextricably linked to their Savior, to Christ. They weren't to, to go on from uh, having the Passover and to forget about that, and now to, to get busy uh, getting rid of all their sin. To look back to how God delivered them and to celebrate that by removing the sin from their midst. That's why Paul says in Hebrews 12 that we really, we really ought to be sanctified, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It is then with our eyes fixed on, on Christ that we will be sanctified. We must now, behold his words. And we must behold his, his works. And we should look upon his compassion. We should look upon his, his power and authority. We should look upon uh, his great sacrifice and, and his total obedience. We should look upon what he's, he's done for us uh, on the cross. We should look at his resurrection. We should look at his ministry of intercession at the Father's right hand for us now. That will show us uh, the glory of the Lord that will transform us. Those things are, are found in, in the Word of God. And so a, a greater time spent in the Word of God, but not just a greater time, a greater amount of meditation on the things of Scripture, and particularly even uh, for what we're talking about this morning, the Gospels. To see the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, to behold the Lamb there. And so uh, we are to, to behold the Lamb, we are to keep the feast in light of the Lamb, but this requires action also. You see that in, in verse 8, they're to celebrate the feast, and not with old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And then, so he's saying we need to be diligent to put away these things in light of what Christ has done. And so he says, put away malice, and malice is like a, a sort of inward viciousness. It's usually something hidden. It's not something that people might recognize. Uh, it actually means like a, a badness of quality. So it involves a, a corruption on the, on the inside, a, dis, a disposition to be malicious. And then wickedness. They're also mentioned there is like a, an, an active exercise of that, an outward uh, moving on those motives, acting on those motives. And Paul says to remove that, remove that corruption, remove that maliciousness. It is, is not fitting in light of what Christ has done. And he says to get rid of those things and replace them with sincerity and truth, which are really the opposites of those things. Sincerity being uh, purity, uh, genuineness. Uh, when, it is, when it is under a, a light, it shows itself to be without corruption. There's not, not hidden corruptions. And truth is also a, a similar thing, a, a truthfulness um, that uh, it's, it's straightforward. What you see is what you get, in a sense. And that correlates to unleavened bread. The hidden corruption isn't there. It's been purified. I think he mentions those things specifically because they deal with uh, sin that is, is undealt with, in a sense. It deals with the, the hidden corruptions that he says are to be removed. It deals with things that are, are much like leaven in our lives that will uh, affect us in every area. And Paul says it, it can't be that way with us, not with a, a holy people. It says to, to look to what Christ has done, having removed those things from us, 
and we ought to look to Christ as we, as we put those things away from us and put on sincerity and, and truth. You know, g- great love for Christ doesn't allow the presence of, of corruption in us to, to remain there. It, it doesn't uh, remain untroubled by those things in us. Great love for Christ is, is distressed by seeing the, the sin in, in our lives. It's distressed by seeing the sin in, in our church. And I want to remind us in, in an age where that seems to have been forgotten, where, where love for Christ doesn't seem to have to correlate to, to obedience and, and to repentance, we need to re- remind ourselves that Christ died to purify ourselves from these things. Uh, and so we ought to go after that also because that's what he has done for us. That's why it's, it's crazy to boast in an environment where that sin is, is allowed and not mourned over. That's why it's important to, to remove that corruption where it does exist before it spreads and causes more damage. Because of what Christ has done, uh, having made us a, a holy people, we ought to be jealous for that work, jealous for the purity that Christ has brought us. I think this year, many of us, no doubt, probably sense the, the weight uh, of our own sin, the corruption, and, and having wanted probably for a long time to, to remove that and to be sanctified from it, many frustrations, uh, many long-term troubles in terms of dealing with sin. Paul wants us to recognize this morning that we've been purified by them from the Lamb. And that is by looking to him that we will continue to be purified. I trust that it is out of a, a love for Christ that we want to do that. It ought to be a concern for his glory, a concern for what he has done. And the pathway to, to honoring him and the pathway to being pure, to being a pure church, is by beholding the Lamb. So let's make sure we do that this year. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, what we've just read. Lord, uh, we really are uh, thankful for the Lamb. Lord, we thank you that we can know that we have been cleansed. That before you, we are righteous. Before you, we are holy, purely because of what Christ has done. Lord, we pray that we would remember that. And that would cause us, when we do have sin in our lives, to run to you and confess, looking to Christ for forgiveness for those things. Pray also, Lord, as we, as we seek to honor you in our lives, as we seek to be a, a pure church, that you would help us to put away the, the corruptions in us, put away sin within us. Lord, and we, we know that this will only happen by beholding the Lamb by looking to Christ. And so we, we look forward to doing that. We pray that you'd refresh us in doing that. Lord, uh, inspire us this morning to, to long to do that and desire to uh, spend this year, Lord, and, and all of our futures uh, beholding the Lamb. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.